Chapter 18 of Murder in the Gun Room. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Murder in the Gun Room by H. Beam Piper. Chapter 18. Dave Ritter, driving his small coupe, kept his eye on the white state police car ahead. Rand, who had come away from the Fleming house in the white car, had called Ritter from the office of the Justice of the Peace while waiting for Walters to put up bail after his hearing. Now, en route to Gwinnett's, he was briefing his assistant on what had happened. "'So everything's set,' he concluded. Mrs. Fleming jumped at it. She knows you're coming in your own car, which you may keep in the garage there. You've left New Belfast about now. If you show up around three, you'll be safe on the driving time. Your name is Davies. I decided on that in case I suffer a lapsus lingue and call you Dave in front of somebody.' "'Yeah, I'll have to watch and not call you Jeff, Colonel Rand, sir.' He nodded toward the glove-box. "'That leech and Rigdon's in there. You'd better get it out before I go to the Flemings.' The guy at the drive-in made a positive identification. It's the one he sold Fleming. "'I saw the rest of the pistols he has there. Don't waste time looking him up about them. They stink. And I saw a tip this morning. He got young Jarrett sprung on a writ. He thought for a moment. What does this do to the Rivers and Fleming murders? We can look for one man for both jobs now, Rand said. Probably the motive for Fleming was that merger he was so violently opposed to, and the Rivers killing must have been a security measure of some sort. There, that must be Gwinnett's now. The state police car had pulled up in front of a large three-story frame house with faded and discolored paint and a jigsaw scroll work around the cornices standing among a clump of trees beside the road. McKenna and Cavalline got out, with Walters between them, and started up the path to the front steps. Ritter stopped behind the white sedan, and he and Rand got out. By that time, Walters and the two policemen were on the front porch. Suddenly, Ritter turned and sprinted around the right side of the house. Rand stood looking after him for a moment, then started to follow more slowly. As he did, a shot slammed in the rear. Jerking out the changeling thirty-eight special, he whirled and ran around the left side of the house, arriving at the rear in time to see Gwinnett standing on a boardwalk between the house and the stable garage behind, with his hands raised. There was a fresh bullet scar on the boardwalk at his feet. Ritter was covering him from the corner of the house with the three eighty Beretta. Rand strolled over to Gwinnett, frisked him, and told him to put his hands down. "'Nice, Dave,' he complimented. "'I thought of that, too, about a minute too late. "'As soon as he saw Walters coming up the walk with police, he knew what had happened. "'Come on, Gwinnett, we'll go through the house and let them in.' Gwinnett's eyes darted from side to side, like the eyes of a trapped animal. "'I don't know what you're talking about,' he said, stiff-lipped. "'What is this, a stick-up?' Nobody bothered to tell him to stop kidding. They marched him through the kitchen, where a negro girl, her arms white with flour, was dithering in fright, and into the front hall. A woman in a faded house-dress had just admitted the two officers and the former Fleming butlers. "'You goddamn rat!' Gwinnett yelled at Walters as soon as he saw him. "'For God's sake, Carl,' the woman begged, "'don't make things any worse than they are. Keep quiet.' "'All right, Gwinnett,' McKenna said. "'We're arresting you. Receiving stolen goods and accessory to larceny. We have a search warrant. Want to see it?' "'So you have a search warrant,' Gwinnett said. "'So go ahead and search. If you don't find anything, you'll plant something. I want to call my lawyer.' "'That's your right,' McKenna told him. "'Arvo, take him to a phone. Let him call the White House if he wants to.' He turned to Walters. Now, where would he have this stuff stashed? In the garret, sir. I know the way. As Cavalline accompanied Gwinnett to the phone, Walters started upstairs. Rand and McKenna followed, with Mrs. Gwinnett bringing up the rear. During the search of the attic, she stood to one side, watching the ex-butler dig into a pile of pistols. This is one, gentlemen, Walters said, producing a Springfield 1818 model flintlock. And here's the Walker Colt, and the forty caliber Colt Patterson, and the Hall. 
Eventually, he had them all assembled, including the five cased sets. Rand found a couple of empty bushel baskets and laid the pistols in them, between layers of old newspapers. He picked up one, and McKenna took the other, while Walters piled the five flat hardwood cases into his arms like cordwood. Still saying nothing, her eyes stony with hatred, the woman followed them downstairs. The rest of the afternoon was consumed with formalities. Gwinnett was given a hearing, at which he was represented by a lawyer straight out of a B-grade gangster picture. Rand had a heated argument with an overzealous justice of the peace, who wanted to impound the pistols and jackknife mark them for identification. But after hurling bloodthirsty threats of a damage suit for an astronomical figure, he managed to retain possession of the recovered weapons. Ritter left a little past three to report for duty in the Fleming household. Rand rode with McKenna and Cavaline to the state police substation, where the pistols were transferred to McKenna's personal car, in which they and Rand were to be transported back to the Fleming place. It was five o'clock before Rand had finished telling the sergeant and the corporal everything he felt they ought to know. "'When we get to the Flemings, I'll give you that revolver I got from the coroner,' he finished. "'One of your boys can take it to this fellow Umholtz and get him to identify it. He might also want to show it to young Gillis and see what he knows about it. Gillis might even give you a name for who got it from Rivers. I'm not building any hopes on that.' and the reason I'm not is that Gillis is still alive. If he knew, I don't think he would be. Yeah, I can see that, McKenna nodded. Fact is, I can see everything now, except one thing. This pistol switch somebody gave you, what's the idea of that? Why, that's because I'm on the spot, Rand told him. I'm to be killed, and somebody else is to be killed along with me. The twenty-five automatic will be used on me, and the thirty-eight will be used on the other fellow and we'll be found dead about five feet apart, and I'll be holding my own gun, and the other fellow will be holding the twenty-five, and it will look as though we shot it out and scored a double knockout. That way my mouth will be shut about what I've learned since I came here, and the man who's supposed to have killed me will take the rap for Fleming and Rivers both. Nothing to stop an investigation like a couple of corpses who can't tell their own story and can take the blame for everything. Jesus! Cavaline's eyes widened. That must be just it. Well, you got your nerve about you, I'll say that, McKenna commented. You sit there and talk about it like it was something that was going to happen to Joe Dokes and Oscar Zilch. He looked at Rand intently. You want us to keep an eye on you? Rand leaned over and spat into the brass cuspidor a gesture of braggadocio he had picked up among the French Marquis. Hell no, that's the last thing I do want, he said. I want him to try it. You realize, don't you, that all this is pure assumption and theory? We don't have a single fact, as it stands, that proves anything. We could go and pick this fellow up, and he's one of three men, so we could grab all three of them, and even if we found the twenty-five Webley and Scott, and my thirty-eight in his pockets— we couldn't charge him with anything. Fact is, right now we can't even prove that Lane Fleming's death was anything but the accident it's on the books as being. But let him take a shot at me. And then you'll have another nice clear case of self-defense, McKenna frowned. God damn it, Jeff. You've had to defend yourself too many times already. This'll be, well, how many will it be? Counting Germans, Rand grinned. Hell, I don't know. I can't remember all of them. One thing, Cavaline said solemnly. You never hear of any lawyers springing people out of cemeteries on writs. Look, Jeff, McKenna said at length. If it's the way you think, this guy won't dare kill you instantly, will he? Seems to me, the way the script reads, this other guy shoots you, and you shoot back and kill him. And then you die, isn't that it? Rand nodded. I'm banking on that. He'll try to give me a fatal, but not instantly fatal, wound, and that means he'll have to take time to pick his spot. The reason I've managed to survive these people against whom I've had to defend myself has been that I just don't give a damn where I shoot a man. 
A lot of good police officers have gotten themselves killed because they tried to wing somebody and took a second or so longer about shooting than they should have. Something in that, too, McKenna agreed. But what I'm getting at is this. I think I know a way to give you a little more percentage. He rose. Wait a minute. I'll be right back. End of chapter 18